Okay. So just as a reminder, we'll put this out onto the uh, onto the web for everybody in the community to see. So Liam, thanks so much for doing this. Um, your your work is already, I think, having a big impact on the field, and it'll be great just to hear from you. Um, any any thoughts you have, current research, future directions, whatever you'd like to talk about, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. So yeah, um, thanks so much for having me, and it'll be fun to get feedback either from people live or from people who wanted to you know, see the talk and, and get back to me. Mm -hmm. um, we, so the, the amount of time allocated here is on the order of like 45 minutes, something like that. That's, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, I mean, we can um, wrap up early if we need to. Uh, we'll see how things go. So I'll go ahead and um, let's see, share my screen. And, okay, you guys seeing that? Apparently a free keynote update is available. Good. All right, so, is that sharing effectively? Yes. Okay, cool. So, my name is Liam Holt and uh, I'm from New York University. Um, and the details of how to get in touch with me are here. Um, and it would be great to hear from, from people with ideas and uh, to continue a conversation after this. So what we're gonna talk about today is the fact that the cell is this fantastically crowded environment. And here's a nice illustration from David Goodsell to kind of get that point across. And so what might some consequences of this crowding be? And one thing that's very intuitive is that you can drastically affect the ability of molecules or organelles or complexes to move around inside this crowded environment. And you know, this is just like if you're driving down the FDR, um, not right now, right now it's really easy to drive down the FDR, but usually if you're driving down the FDR um, and they close one lane of, a free, of the freeway, then you get this very rapid nonlinear slow down and in terms of you know the physics of this you know with when you talk to a physicist about the jamming transition they think about frictionless spheres which is um not something that really exists in biology now these frictionless spheres they jam at you know volume fractions of 60 ish percent but in biology like i said it's very very different all of these molecules in the cell are interacting and colleagues downtown at NYU, so Yasna Brzezik here, um, she has looked at just simple spheres that are you know, made of polystyrene and they have little sticky patches on them so they can interact. And if you just look at this movie right here, even a 20% volume fraction of these sticky particles will start to jam. And the cell, is at a volume fraction, so the amount of volume taken up by stuff in the cell is on the order of 40%. And so we think that the system is really on the edge of what's physically possible in terms of having efficient molecular motion. So that's one thing. And so let's take a look at a consequence of that in terms of what happens when you start to increase the volume fraction, increase the crowding in the cell. So one way that we've been doing this is by compressing cells. So physical compression is something that has to be dealt with by all kinds of organisms from microorganisms through to our tissues and our, and our cells and our tissues. And this is a, a microfluidics approach that was developed by Morgan de la Rue, who was in my lab and now has his own group in Toulouse. Um, so what we're looking at here is a PDMS chamber and these are yeast cells, and they're loaded in through this large loading channel, well, it's big enough for a cell to get in. And the, the chamber here is fed constantly by these nutrient channels. So the nutrients, um, the, the media is exchanged every second. And what I'm gonna show is the cells uh, growing and dividing, and as they do so, pay attention to these little pincers here and the shape of the ch chamber in general which is gonna to start to get distorted as the cells grow and divide. 
So this is PDMS, it's elastic. And you see the pincers now close off this loading channel. You can get completely confined. And this allows the system to build up compressive stress. And by looking at how much the chamber is distorted, we know the Young's modulus, the stiffness of this material. So from looking at this distortion, we can calculate how much compression, how much pressure is in the system. And we can look at molecules inside the cell as we do this. This is an RNA molecule. And if we look at a couple of different um, pressures, what we see is that at low, relatively low pressure, this RNA molecule moves around relatively freely. And as we get up to higher pressures, you start to see the molecules moving much more slowly. And we think this is a consequence of this kind of jamming effect. And if you look at what happens to the growth rate of cells as a function of this growth-induced pressure, you see this exponential decrease in growth rate. And again, we don't 100% understand why this is, but this is a universal phenomenon. You see this in mammalian cells and yeast cells and bacterial cells, always this exponential dependence of growth rate on pressure. And we, we, again, we think that this has an underpinning in the physics of jamming. So that's something that Morgan and I um, are continuing to study. So on the other hand, it turns out that this crowded environment is also important, we think, for biology to go ahead efficiently. And here's a collaboration that we had recently with Angelica Amon, um, looking at what happens when you arrest cells in the cell cycle and therefore uncouple the nucleus, um, the, the chromosome content essentially from the cell size. What happens, I, I won't go into the details, but what happens is that at a certain critical size of the cell, it seems that the cytoplasm becomes too dilute. And then when you try and release the cells from this arrest, they can't, they can't go, they, they're senescent. So the idea is that some degree of crowding, and in this case also some concentration, some critical concentration of certain molecules are necessary for biology to be able to continue. Uh, another example of this is, you know, the example of the Xenopus extract. The, one of the reasons that you can do amazing things with the Xenopus extract, get the entire cell cycle to go, get the mitotic spindle to build and divide, is probably that you're able to isolate cytoplasm that's a very high crowding, high concentration. And if you dilute that just a little bit too much, like more than about 10%, the entire thing just stops working. So, that's a little bit speculative, but um, why might this be? Why is it that having enough crowding is also important? And so one simple way of thinking about this is that crowding also helps to favor molecular assembly. So if you consider this simple binding reaction, if you add a crowder to the system, then what happens is that usually for the bound state, there's this entropic cost. But if you add the crowder, now when you have the bound state here, although the entropy of the, these two molecules has decreased, there's more space opened up for the rest of the, the crowded molecules. And so the entropy of the system is maybe even increased or certainly not decreased as much. And so this is called the uh, depletion attraction effect. And, and it can help to drive reactions forward. And a good example of this would be, you know, for those of us that remember doing DNA ligation reactions you know, before Gibson cloning and all that, um, we had our regular DNA ligase kit and we had our rapid ligase kit. And the reason that the rapid ligase kit goes in five minutes instead of an hour is that crowding agent was added to it. So you can really drive reactions a lot more quickly by adding crowded to the system. On the other hand, if you go too far, as I presented earlier, then you start to jam the system up and these molecules can't bind each other anymore. And what this means is that if you look at the rate constant of some reaction that depends on this kind of binding effect, 
as a function of crowding agent, you'll get this kind of biphasic behavior with an optimum. And presumably the cell has mechanisms to maintain its internal crowding at or around this optimum value. And I'll point out that this optimum might not be the same for every reaction. So that's an interesting potential source of sensing and regulation in the cell. For example, uh, just say dilution is not good and too much compression is not good in terms of growth rate, but there are some more subtle things that can happen. So for example, if you slightly compress a cell, you can get these dramatic phenotypic changes to occur. And this has been observed for a while, but here's a really nice example of that from Kevin, Kevin Alessandri. Um, so what he's doing here is growing just a spheroid of mammalian cancer cells. And what you see on the left here, uh, that this spheroid of cells, it kind of just grows and it stays fairly cohesive, nothing particularly dramatic here. On the right, it's exactly the same cells, but what they developed was a really nice alginate encapsulation technology. So they essentially injected the same cells into a thin gel capsule. And the capsule was designed such that the cells could build up compressive stress and pressure, but, and then eventually rupture the capsule. So just pay attention as it ruptures to what happens to the cells upon release from this compressive environment. And you see that there's this dramatic change in their motility, their um, coherence and so forth. And this kind of EMT type behavior driven by compression is being observed in, in multiple places. So there's a sense that these compressive events can drive these, these large regulatory changes. And of course there are active signaling processes involved here, things like piezo channels and um, various signaling pathways. But it's interesting to consider that some of these general physico-chemical environmental changes inside the cell may also play a role. In fact, they're certainly going to play a role in all biology. Okay, so the cell is this crazy crowded environment. And of course, this audience realizes that this particular picture from David Goodsell, it's based on a prokaryotic system. In fact, it's, it's far more messy than that in eukaryotic cells where there's a huge fraction of disorder in this proteome and in, in terms of the polymers that, that are around in the cell. So this, this is actually what got me into this whole mess in the first place, um, was thinking about disorder. Um, this thing is, the cell is also, you know, it's not a simple frictionless sphere system where the, all the spheres being the same size, it's, it's tremendously polydispersed. So you have molecules that range over orders of magnitude of length scale, and then you get up into organelles and so forth. And a particularly poorly understood length scale is what we call the mesoscale, um, which is about the, the range between 10 and a couple of hundred nanometers of diameter. Uh, and that's where a lot of really interesting biology is going on. For example, all of the transcriptional machinery, or the translational machinery, proteasomes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the assemblies of proteins and nucleic acids that are controlling a lot of the, the reactions and the, and the regulation of the cell. So getting back to this disorder, as I was saying, the reason that I got into this whole mess is that, you know, back as a, a graduate student and then as a, 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 a the year right after that, um, I was looking at the cycle independent kinase and we did a quantitative mass spectrometry screen to figure out where a bunch of its, uh, well, what a bunch of its substra substrates were and where those substrates were being phosphorylated in the protein. And this is just a very simple diagram to show that, um, let me minimize this, that what I'm showing here is the fraction of the proteome that's predicted to be in helix, sheet, or loop with one prediction algorithm or over here, disorder versus domain. And the gray is the fraction of the proteome in general. And if we just focus over here in the disorder. So first of all, you know, 30 to 40% of a typical eukaryotic proteome is predicted to be disordered, which was kind of shocking to me at the time. And now I think is becoming more and more, um, there's more and more awareness of this now. But this is where all of the regulation is happening. 
in terms of phosphoregulation and lots of other post-translational post modifications. So really, the, the reason I started thinking about all of this physicochemical environment stuff is I was trying to figure out, well, how on earth do you derive regulation from phosphorylating all of this disordered protein? It didn't really fit with this, you know, Leninger textbook model of phosphates coordinating a precise change in the conformation of a protein. Um, while, of course, that does happen, it's perhaps a minority of cases. So the questions that we were asking are, how is the en environment of the, this crowded, crazy environment regulated in the cell? Um, how does this crowding impact physiology? And finally, does this crowding change in disease conditions? And in particular, we've been thinking about what happens when we start to build up compressive stress or changes in the mechanical environment. Okay, so the first story I'll tell you about is uh, driven by Greg Brittingham and uh, a grad student in my lab and Morgan Delarue, who now has his own lab in Toulouse. And it's about the control of physical properties. And I should say that I'll pause in a couple of places uh, explicitly for questions, but you could also jump in at any point with a question if you, if you have one. So the way that we've been studying the physical properties, the crowding in the cell is through this technique of passive microreology, which is simply the idea that if you watch the motion of some kind of passive tracer inside a, a material, you can infer things about the properties of that material. So here's a very simple kind of illustration of that. If you have, imagine you can't see the environment, but you can see this green bead. And if you watch the bead, you can, you can guess that this bead that just jiggles a little bit is in a far more crowded environment than this bead over here that is moving more freely. So that's just a very gross simplification of the field of microreology. Um, now the way that people have studied this in the past has been to microinject inert nanoparticles or to get them to get into cells by, by other techniques such as uh, pinocytosis. Um, but these kind of techniques have been quite labor intensive and typically very low, low, low throughput. They tend to perturb cells, for example, by diluting the cytoplasm and disrupting membranes. And very importantly, they've been completely impossible in any organism that has a cell wall. For example, cerevisiae, which is one of our workhorses for figuring out the initial genetics of systems. So to overcome these limitations, what we decided to do was develop these genetically encoded multimeric nanoparticles, or GEMS. So what these are is a gene that encodes a protein that we got from um, hypothermophilic archaea. And these proteins are encapsulins. So prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles, but they do almost universally make these protein cages. And what's cool about the encapsulins is that it's just a single protein, a single monomer, that very robustly self-assembles in, in this case, 120 copies of this monomer to form this precisely defined nanoparticle cage, which is about 40 nanometers in diameter. And all we had to do was to tag this thing with green fluorescent protein and the C-terminus is projected into space. And so what you wind up with is this nanoparticle of perfectly defined shape and size that is coated with 120 GFP molecules. So it's nice and bright. And we can use this as a genetically encoded nanoparticle. Any cell that has this gene in its genome will constantly produce nanoparticles that we can then look at and track and do physical analysis with. And this size here is at that sweet spot, that length scale, the mesoscale, where we think that a lot of interesting biology is happening. So here's what it looks like in a mammalian cell. This is a pancreatic cell, um, and this is a yeast cell. So here we have the gem nanoparticles, and here we have the nucleus, actin, and this is a real-time movie. So 
the movie is looping and this is four seconds of acquisition. We're acquiring a frame every 10 milliseconds to be able to do accurate particle tracking on these, these nanoparticles. And we can get thousands of tracks from a single cell in this four second experiment. So we can really brute force through lots and lots of experiments using this kind of approach. Here, are the, uh, this is Cerevisiae. No one had ever been able to do rheology on a, a yeast cell before. Um, but now we can get these nanoparticles into these, these cells that have cell walls. And you immediately start to see some really interesting things just by looking at these cells. So for example, in this single cell right here, you have some nanoparticles that are barely moving and other ones that are moving quite freely. So there's a, even within a single cell, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity, you would guess, in the intracellular physical properties. And my guess is that this kind of uh, low impeded mo movement right here might be a, a reflection of some kind of local jamming. So as soon as we started looking at these cells with the gem nanoparticles, um, I'm honestly I sort of designed this technology to ask a different set of questions. Um, but what we immediately observed was that even on a global scale, the physical properties of the cell were not constant. And from day to day and experiment to experiment, it seemed like there was quite a bit of variation in the uh, diffusion coefficients that we would get from, from tracking these particles. So we decided to try and figure this out. And, and one thing that we figured out was that the cells are way more sensitive to the precise um, growth conditions and nutrition conditions than people often um, take care with in, in yeast experiments. Um, and you, you don't need to have very much perturbation at all uh, before you start to see these big physical changes. And we tracked it down to amino acid starvation. So this is the um, effective diffusion coefficient normalized to control here. And when, when you start to run out of amino acids, you start to see this big bump up in the diffusion coefficient of these nanoparticles, suggesting that the crowding inside the cell is decreasing. And since this is amino acids, we immediately thought about a potential regulator of the system, which is TORC1, which is known to be the, one of the main sensors of amino acids. So TOR kinase, um, it's a central regulator of growth and metabolism. It integrates a lot of in information about, you know, in mammalian cells growth factors, in all cells, you know, amino acids, carbon source, and stress. And it controls pretty much everything. And so the reason it's called target of rapamycin is because of this guy. So this is one of those heads from Easter Island. Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui, which is where this small molecule was discovered that turns out to very, very specifically and potently inhibit this kinase. So we can simply use this um, ancient technology from Rapa Nui, rapamycin, to, to ask the question, is Tor kinase the thing that is controlling the physical properties of the cell? So here's the experiment. Here's the same movie I showed you before. Again, look at these jammed nanoparticles. After treatment with rapamycin, and this takes an hour to manifest this effect. So it's not an immediate kinase inhibition effect. Um, so what you see is that after treatment with rapamycin, I think even by eye, you can get a sense that the nanoparticles are moving more rapidly and you don't really see these jammed nanoparticles as much anymore. And if we quantify that, so this is the value of the effective diffusion coefficient of these nanoparticles. Um, in the control, and then treatment with rapamycin increases this diffusion coefficient, again, suggesting a decrease in crowding in the cell. So how is Tor impacting these physical properties of the cytoplasm? And this was a question that um, we would never have answered if we didn't have this technology, because like I said, Tor controls everything. And all of our great ideas and hypotheses that we had for like the first couple of years as we tried to like slowly work our way through our, our wrong ideas, they were, they were incorrect. And things like cytoskeleton, cell size, and all of this stuff didn't really explain what Tor was doing. But because we were in yeast and because each experiment we could be done, you know, 
in a few seconds and generating a mutant in yeast only takes a couple of days. We could go through hundreds of mutants and finally find the thing that was controlling the, the physical properties here. So what we're looking for is this. So in wild type cell, I'm showing you the same data again. When you treat with rapamycin, the diffusion coefficient increases. We're looking for mutants where this effect of rapamycin goes away. And eventually we found such mutants. And here's an example. So this is SFP1. The control and the rapamycin treated cells look the same. There's no further effect of inhibiting TOR. And actually, sort of maybe unexpectedly, the control condition now is already decrowded. It looks like the, the rapamycin treatment before doing anything. So what is SFP1? It turns out that SFP1 is the major transcription factor that regulates the rate of ribosome biogenesis. And as we looked through the various mutants, um, we found half a dozen or so that had this kind of epistasis with the rapamycin effect. We found two classes that were involved either in ribosome biogenesis or in autophagy. And autophagy is the only thing that really degrades ribosomes. So together, these two processes are tuning ribosome concentration in the cell. So we sent that off and got rejected. And so then I collaborated with uh, my friend Ben Engel, who we were, in grad student, we were in grad school together, and he was in Wolfgang Baumeister's Institute in Munich, and, and they're sort of raison d'etre is doing this amazing cryo FIB milling EM tomography. So you basically take a focused IM beam and you mill out a thin lamellum. So inside this droplet here, you have cells that have been flash frozen in um, liquid helium, I think it is. And as you zap a thin lamellum out, the, the cell will be revealed um, into a 500 nanometer well, piece of cytoplasm or nucleus or what have you. You can then take this lamellum, you can stick it into a direct detector cryo, a direct detector EM beam and rotate the sample and do tomography. And so this is uh, our experiment. So here are organelles and so forth. And as we pan back, you can fill in the electron densities with known structures. And one of the things that dominates is the cyan thing, and this is ribosomes. And you can see just how crazy packed the cytoplasm is with ribosomes. These orange things are our nanoparticles. And so, for example, you can imagine that right here in this area, you might have a local jamming, but over here, it might be a little bit more free. I mean, that's speculation, but if you inhibit TOR kinase, what you immediately see by eye is that this concentration of ribosomes has dropped by almost twofold, and a lot more space has opened up. So very clearly, TOR is controlling the concentration of ribosomes in cytoplasm. And we were able to quantify in a whole bunch of conditions and mutants and treatments what the relationship was between the diffusion coefficient of, of nanoparticles versus the concentration of ribosome concentration, uh, the concentration of ribosomes. And we were able to completely parameterize this Doolittle equation that predicts how um, Crowder should impact diffusion. And this blue line is a prediction. It's not fit to these data points at all. It's just what we predict should happen. And the data points fall pretty much on the line, which doesn't say that our model is true, but it definitely says that our model is not crazy. So this is what we think is going on. Um, with TOR kinase and the regulation of the physical properties of the cytoplasm at this length scale. So what might consequences of these crowding changes be? Well, an obvious one that we've already seen is that the rate at which particles move in the cell will change. But beyond that, as I introduced earlier, um, you can also have dramatic effects potentially on the interaction of molecules. And this is where we started getting back into this idea of phase separation. So here's the famous vinaigrette Google image search. And then on the right, we have Cliff's um, 
Plus Worm from Woods Hole. And as we all know in this call, um, this is the spontaneous demixing of macromolecules. Um, and while um, I introduced earlier that a simple bimolecular reaction, the, the binding of this bimolecular interaction can be favored by Crowder, this is perhaps even more true of phase separation. And if you look at all of the phase separation papers and the methods of all of the in vitro work, the vast majority of them are adding FICOL or PEG or what have you. And every single crystal structure that was ever made screened through these crowding conditions to try and get phase separation to, to work. And the reason is similar, that as you add Crowder, you offset the entropic cost of this condensation reaction of these networks of molecules forming, and you tend to drive that phase separation event. But is the change that we see in the concentration of ribosomes in the cell sufficient to make a difference to any kind of phase separation that might be biologically relevant? And it's not clear that that would be the case. I mean, we're seeing a, a twofold change in ribosome concentration. So we decided to explicitly ask this question. And what we used as our model system, so we were working in the Summer Institute at Woods Hole, um, along with Mike Rosen and a bunch of other people. Tony um, was there as well. And so we were using Mike Rosen's SUMO SIM system, where you have this poly SUMO multivalent uh, molecule interacting with the SUMO interaction motif. And what we see here is a graph showing partition coefficients as a function of ribosome concentration. And these ribosome concentrations are the same ribosome concentrations that you find in the cell. So in a happily growing, crowded cell, you have about, well, you have exactly 23 micromolar ribosome concentration. And in this condition, you have a partition coefficient above three, and that's shown in this micrograph here. This is a completely in vitro system. Again, this is just ribosomes and then the polysumo and the polysim. And then this is the concentration of ribosomes once you've inhibited TOR kinase with rapamycin. So you go down to about 13 micromolar. And you can see that the degree of um, phase separation, the partition coefficient, has gone down. You also see things like the, the amount of wetting is higher, so surface tension is lower, I guess. So very clearly, in vitro, just this very, very simple system, you can certainly tune phase separation. But how about in the cell? Well, the cool thing about the sumo sim system is that you can do the same re reaction, the same condensation reaction in a cell. In this case, we use a um, sumo 10 sim 6 um, single polypeptide fusion to make sure that the stoichiometry of these things are always the same, um, fused to M cherry. And again, this is a plasmid that we designed based on, on Mike's work. Um, and so here we have cerevisiae cells and um, human cells. So everything we did in cerevisiae, we also did in mammalian cells. And the two things track, both in terms of the earlier work with genetics and also this work with phase separation. So what you can see is that with high ribosome concentration, you have a large amount of phase separation. Uh, phase separation and with lower ribosome concentration after rapamycin treatment, the number and size of these droplets goes down. And that's quantified here. After rapamycin, you have less total droplets. And very importantly, we have this control where we use sorbitol to compress cells and therefore increase crowding again. And we can figure out how to perfectly increase crowding back to what it was prior to rapamycin treatment just by looking at the gems. So we put in enough sorbitol to restore the gem motion to pre-rapamycin conditions. Um, this turns out to be a pretty heavy compression for cerevisiae, much less so for mammalian cells. And what you see is you recover phase separation. Not 100%, and this is probably because we're losing a little bit of protein as we inhibit translation with TOR kinase inhibition as well. But you certainly recover most of the phase separation. So this paper was published a little while ago. Um, now, like a year ago, and just in summary, for these nanoparticles, we can see that the um, concentration of ribosomes modulates the effective viscosity, the crowding in the cell, and, in t and also, at the same time, tunes phase separation. 
So I want to pause here um, and see if anyone has any questions that they, they'd like to raise. Hey, uh, this is Deanna. That, that was beautiful. Uh, it's very elegant. I just have a, uh, a question. So what do you think happens to the ribosomes in, in that time span of, of an hour, given that the, the lifetime of a ribosome is five to 10 days? Do they dissociate to decrease the crowding? We know that autophagy is really important. So if we inhibit autophagy, we don't get these same changes. Um, so what, what is probably happening is that the, you know, as you inhibit TOR kinase, you turn off production, but you also turn up autophagy, and that's probably degrading a lot of the ribosomes. Cell volume is increasing a little bit as well, not a ton. Um, so that may help dilute a little bit. Um, so that, that would be my answer. Okay, and um, also talking about timelines, can you, um, what would be the timeline of reversing the process. So if you wash out uh, rapamycin, how, how quickly do you... a good question. You... Yeah, we haven't done that experiment, honestly. Um, it's a little tricky to wish, wash out rapamycin. It's, it tends to stick around. Um, but we, we honestly haven't tried. It's a really good question. We can, I'm sure we can figure out how to do it with a different molecule, like a rapalog or something. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Any more thoughts or questions? Well, on that last point, I think the Rapalog idea is a good one because as I'm sure you know, some of the other Rapalogs that actually made it all the way to market or into the clinic had very different physical properties. Mm. And so their behavior, their physical behavior in your system could be quite different. So that's probably how I would think about it. Try to find the most structurally diverse, the most polar Rapalogs that are still highly potent. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting to see if they could be distinguished based on this physical effect as well, if that tracks with any, you know, clinical applications. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? Okay, I'll keep going. So if you have any other ideas, feel free to interject. Um, okay. So just a quick uh, s a little side note here. Um, we've been studying the nucleus as well. So these, these nanoparticles, we started out in the cytoplasm, but it turns out we can also send them to the nucleus just by putting a nuclear localization signal on them. Um, turns out that the way that we have to do that is by putting the NLS on the N-terminus. And because if we put the NLS on the C-terminus, you get these very strong interactions with the nuclear periphery. Probably there's a lot of interactions with the nuclear pore. But if we put it on the N-terminus, what happens is that we think, in fact, we pretty much know, that the monomers go into the nucleus and then the particles assemble inside the nucleus. And they're big enough that they, we don't think that they fall out of the nucleus anymore. So these are nuclear gems here. And this is a human cell, a pancreatic cell. And this is more or less where the nucleus is. Now I just told you that we don't think that the nanoparticles can really get out through the nuclear pore, but there are nanoparticles out here in the cytoplasm and in a mammalian cell. So we wondered about that. Um, and it turns out that they're falling out during mitosis. So here's a, a much uh, longer time scale movie. And the particles start in the nucleus, but then upon mitosis, you'll see that all of the nanoparticles they not only fall out, they're, it's almost like they're forcibly ejected from the nucleus. And you wind up with these two daughter cells that have nanoparticles in the cytoplasm and not in the nucleus. And if you wait for a while, you'll start to see that the particles form again in the nucleus and um, you eventually get back to this kind of state where you have particles in both compartments, which is fine. We can you know, stain the nucleus and we can um, analyze each compartment individually. We thought it was kind of interesting um, and one of the reasons this was really interesting, oh, and I'll just show that in a sensible organism like yeast, that like most biology does closed my mitosis and not this crazy open mitosis that mammalian cells do. So here are nuclei and the cell outline in cerebrosis cell, and here are nanoparticles. They're completely in the nucleus. Here's a time projection. 
And basically, you never see nanoparticles in the cytoplasm in yeast. And again, yeast don't have an open mitosis, so there's no opportunity for these nanoparticles to get out. Now, the, the reason this was a bit confusing at first was that, oops, let's go back. Sorry. So if we look at these movies again, so here's the nuclear gems and the nanoparticles are in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. But our original gems that we looked at, they were never in the nucleus. So what's going on? Because this is a stable cell line. This has gone through dozens and dozens and dozens of divisions, and yet there are no nanoparticles at all in the nucleus. So we, we sort of took with Daniel Gaelic about this at Woods Hole, and um, he's been very interested in how the chromatin and the nucleus are reorganized during mitosis and then the exit from mitosis. I just want to share this one result because it's really cool. Hopefully this will come out soon. So this is Daniel's work, um, Sarah Kulian and Mina Petrovich in, in his lab. So he took advantage of our gems and um, here we have chromosomes that are in, they're actually arrested in nicotazole in, uh, in, in mitosis. And you can see that actually when you have the chromosomes condensed, there's an intermingling of the nanoparticles with the DNA. You can see it down here with the gems alone here. If we watch a movie, he's adding reversin, so he's driving exit from mitosis. And what you see is that as the cell reassembles its nucleus, the nanoparticles get forced out. So we can, we can look and see, you know, just stills here. This is before and this is after reassembly of the nucleus. The chromosomes cluster together. The nuclear envelope forms around those chromosomes and the gems have been completely pushed out of the nucleus. And this is a very efficient process. And it turns out that there's this chromosome clustering mechanism that's super important. Um, so we can look at ribosomes as well. So ribosomes are similar size to gems. This is a GFP tag ribosome subunit. And similar thing, so cells forced out of mitosis, and what you see is that the ribosomes all get pushed out. If we use a mutant that's deficient in clustering the chromosomes, what you see is that upon forced exit from mitosis, you don't get this perfect exclusion of ribosomes anymore. And we can show that the exclusion of ribosomes doesn't really depend on nuclear export pathways. So we can inhibit this typical pathway that would drive um, most nuclear export with leptomycin B. And you still see, in this case, very nice physical exclusion of ribosomes from the newly forming nucleus. And that's quantified here. So the control and, and leptomycin B, they both exclude ribosomes, but the clustering deficient cells don't really do it so well. So the point is that the cell can do amazing things in terms of self-organization using these principles of density and differential um, crowding. And the, you know, you can, the chromatin of a cell can really redefine a, a this length scale the entire nucleoplasm versus cytoplasm before the nuclear envelope is even formed. And this is really important, one might imagine, for all of these molecular complexes that are too big to get out through a nuclear pore. So I thought this was really cool. Um, again, Daniel's work. Um, so, so it was really fun that he was able to follow up on that, that observation. So if we look at, at a a nucleus in interphase now. So here are nuclear nanoparticles, and here we've stained the DNA with sur DNA, and we assume that the brighter stain here corresponds to more sort of heterochromatic regions. And if you just look at the nanoparticles moving around, you can kind of see that the nanoparticles aren't going into the heterochromatin. They're corralled and moving around inside this, what's probably more like the euchromatic compartment. So this physical control is powerful enough to completely define the nucleus versus the cytoplasm. And then once you have a nucleus and it starts to you know, selectively decondense, one might imagine that there's a tremendous regulatory potential here. 
Um, so we're just starting, I mean, we've been working on this for a while, but it's really kind of a challenging thing to, to figure out how to really study this. Um, so this will be a fun thing to maybe chat with you about. Beyond the nucleus, in terms of physical organization of space, we've also targeted the nanoparticles to the endoplasmic reticulum. So this was with Joe Chambers in Cambridge. And what you see here, if we focus on the merge, is that the nanoparticles tend to be, this is actually a 20 nanometer nanoparticle, the smaller one. Um, it, they tend to be in the tubules and the sheets are maybe too thin for the nanoparticles to get into. And this is something that's been known about the ER and sorting in the secretory pathways that there's this size dependent sorting that happens, but we can really see it here. So how might this thing be impacted by you know, physical changes of compression? Okay, so we have these big questions, you know, we're, we're interested in what controls crowding and the physical properties of the nucleus. And we're really interested in whether these physical properties, how and, and when do they impact transcription? Um, so this is a huge set of questions and excited to think about how we might address them and whether other people want to work with us. Okay, that, that was a, sort of a little bit of an aside. Um, now I'll take a moment uh, with this wonderful gif of a rubber band ball being squished to transition into the work that we're doing on compression and crowding. And I'll, I'll sort of zip through this really quickly. Um, everything's a work in progress. Uh, Greg has been really spearheading this. Tomash has been sort of working more on the, the nuclear side of things. And we continue to collaborate always with Morgan. So again, here's our yeast, uh, Morgan's yeast torture device um, that we use for compressing yeast cells. And what we see as the cells build up this one megapascal of pressure, which is 150 PSI, like double the pressure you'd put in a racing road bike tire. Um, what we did is we looked at different particles in the cell, different particles in different compartments as well, and quantified how the diffusion coefficient on the y-axis normalized to the condition with no pressure. How does this diffusion coefficient scale with pressure? This is a semi-log plot, so the straight line indicates that there's this exponential dependence, just, ha just as the, the growth rate has an exponential dependence. And what you can see is that different sized particles, so if you look in the cytoplasm at this 20 nanometer particle versus an RNA, which is more like 100 nanometers, there's this different size scaling um, in terms of diffusion versus pressure. But what's even more interesting to me is that the same exact nanoparticle, 40 nanometer nanoparticle, in the cytoplasm versus the nucleus scales differently. So the nucleus feels compression differently than the cytoplasm feels compression. And we don't know why this is, but of course the crowder here is ribosomes here, we don't know. Um, probably some combination of chromatin and RNA, but it's actually kind of hard to nail it down right now. Um, these different systems are behaving differently. So that's interesting. So like I said, we've been thinking about this in terms of uh, disease models, and, and the two ones that we've been thinking about are cancer, and we're starting very, very recently to think about neurodegenerative disease. But let's, let's start with cancer. So tumors, build up a really tremendous amount of compressive, solid compressive stress. So here's a very evocative image, slightly gruesome from uh, Rakesh Jain's lab. So what they did is they took, a, this is a pancreatic tumor, um, and they took a razor blade essentially and did a very well-defined slice and watched how this thing just pops open. And the reason it pops open is that it has built up solid compressive stress inside. And so we've been focusing on pancreatic cancer because it is the cancer that builds up the most compressive stress of them all. They all build up quite a lot, but pancreatic especially so, because it builds up all of this change in the ECM, all of these tumor-associated macrophages. The, the tissue becomes very stiff. And then as the tumor grows within this stiff tissue, you get this compressive stress. 
Pancreatic cancer is obviously a huge need. It's becoming one of the most deadly cancers. It really, you know, we don't have good treatments. Uh, and one thing that as a geneticist um, was appealing to me is that it's always driven by KRAS. And this is crazy. Like more than 95% of the time, the, these tumors, these um, ductal adenocarcinomas are initiated by a KRAS oncogene. So we decided to check the idea that maybe KRAS would have an impact on crowding in the cell and the physical properties of cells and the ability of cells to respond to compressive stress. And of course, KRAS is related to mTOR uh, in its signaling. And so we did this you know, preliminary experiment, just we took MEFs um, and we either took wild type or KRAS, a single copy of KRAS oncogenic activation mutation, K12D. This is the one that we find in pancreatic cancer. And we just automatically compress cells, just as a very quick and easy way of asking, did the physical properties get modulated? And what you see is that in wild type cells, as you get to these 200, 300 millimolar sorbitol conditions, they all start to die off. But the KRAS cells do better. And so this is enough to motivate us to continue on. And so we decided to make some models for human pancreatic cancer. So we started with these um, human pancreatic nesting expressing cells. Um, so these are a, a fairly well used model for relatively normal pancreatic cells. We knocked out P53 with CRISPR. And then, and the reason we did this is because it's difficult to introduce KRAS oncogenic mutations before you knock out P53. This is not what happens in disease, so that's a caveat, but it allows us to do the comparison of this control P53 knockout versus a mutant where we've introduced the, the KRAS oncogenic mutation. And again, this um, human disease is pretty much always initiated by KRAS, and then you typically get loss of a bunch of tumor suppressors, including P53. So what we immediately see is that there is a substantial change in crowding, the physical, well, the physical properties of the cell. I, I've been saying in the, in the yeast part of the talk that this change in diffusion coefficient, uh, apparent diffusion coefficient is due to crowding. Um, here in the case of these very much uh, more cytoskeletally active systems, um, we see an increase in the diffusion of the nanoparticles. This could be a change in, in crowding. It could also be that the actomycin cytoskeleton, for example, is get, getting way more contractile, and this could have an impact on mobility in the cell. Nevertheless, there is a big change. And so we thought that was interesting. And we decided to look and see how the diffusion coefficient of nanoparticles changes in cells as we do this sorbitol shock condition. So here we have a pancreatic cell again. In control conditions, we have this free diffusion uh, or this rapid diffusion. If we do a 300 millimolar sorbitol shock, we get this. This is a movie right here. You can't really tell except for the fact that it's photobleaching. The nanoparticles, they really almost completely stop moving. So we've really jammed up the system at this length scale. Now, of course, smaller things, um, you know, like individual proteins can still move around in these, in these um, automatically compressed conditions. And that's kind of interesting to think about. Now, 24 hours later, if you come back to these cells, they really haven't started recovering at all. And, and these cells will ultimately go on to die. If we look at the KRAS mutant cells, on the other hand, we start with a higher effective diffusion coefficient. If we shock them, the diffusion slows down, but then 24 hours later, they've completely recovered. And we don't really understand how this is working yet, um, but this is something that we're trying to follow up on. But that's osmotic compressive stress. And while that is relevant to the tumor microenvironment, you have fairly substantial changes in the osmotic um, strength inside tumors. We're, we're really also interested in mechanical compressive stress. So Greg has come up with this very simple system for looking at um, how compression of these HPNA cells impacts their physiology. So he 3D printed this wafer, 
and surrounds it in agarose pads. And then he uses these washers he got from a hardware store to, you know, he sticks these down on cells in an imaging well. And depending on whether he puts washers on there or not, you get compression. And the cool thing about the washers and this wafer is that we can image through the, the hole in the middle. So um, toroids are useful, not only for donuts. <laughs> That's just brilliant, brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, his, that was all Greg, so I was very impressed. So, okay, this is what we see, um, oh, is that it's different than the osmotic compression. So after adding the washer, um, you get this slowdown, uh, and this is probably around a 300 Pascal pressure. It's less than you see in a tumor. Um, and in the KRAS, you also see this slowdown. But the difference here is that the KRAS doesn't really recover. So there's a big difference between osmotic and mechanical compressive stress. Um, these cells, they, they can actually survive this condition. They're, they're not quite so perturbed as the osmotically compressed cells. So they do continue to grow, and they continue to divide. Um, and we need to take out this experiment to longer times to see if the cells eventually recover a bit more. But the, the cells are managing to continue their biology with this very perturbed crowding environment. And one of the consequences of that is that when you look at mitosis, cells going through mitosis, here we have control cells, P53 dilute cells, and we're looking at the fraction of cells that go through mitosis that have a, an error. And what you see is that in the control cells, compressing them doesn't really make a big difference. They, they don't really have a very high rate of mitotic catastrophe. But if you have compression and you have KRAS, so KRAS alone, they're defining just fine. But if you combine these two things, it's a complete just disaster. You have this huge rate of mitotic error. And so here's you know, what a control cell should look like. This is just a DNA stain. It's false colored for the Z stack. Um, so that's why it's rainbow colored. This is just so DNA. And this is anaphase in the cells merrily dividing in a control cell. Um, this is with no compression. But if you take KRAS mutant cells under compression and you watch the kind of thing that happens, this is the same time scale. So this is now, these cells are staying in anaphase for hours and hours and hours. You see this, I mean, I wouldn't even call this a, a bridge. This is just like a failure of segregation of certain chromosomes. We suspect maybe the larger chromosomes are particularly susceptible to this, like chromosomes one, two, three. Um, and you get this just disaster. You, and this is not the only thing you see. You also see multipolar divisions, and you see more subtle mitotic errors. Uh, and we've been spending a lot of time um, acquiring high content movie um, video microscopy and then figuring out how to get computers to track cells and classify divisions, which has been kind of fun, uh, very challenging, especially, you know, like tr tracking divisions when they are so messed up is a real challenge. So why are these cells having such a, a hard time? So we went back to, again, you know, the nuclear nanoparticles and the cytoplasmic nanoparticles to see what happens when we mechanically compress cells. So what I'm showing you here is um, on the y-axis is the percentage decrease in diffusion upon compression. So at zero, that would mean that if we compressed cells, there was no change in diffusion. And as we go down, there's more and more decrease in diffusion when we compress the cell. So if we look at the control cell versus the KRAS mutant and look at cytoplasmic nanoparticles here, we see that they both slow down in this particular condition um, about 20%. But if we look at the nuclear nanoparticles, what we see is that in the control cells, actually the nuclear nanoparticles slow down less than the cytoplasmic nanoparticles. And perhaps uh, this is in contrast to what I showed you earlier with, with yeast, where we're compressing everything isotropically. Um, in mammalian cells, we're applying the compression from above and the nucleus is actually the most mechanically stiff part of the cell. And so I think the nucleus is resisting the compressive stress um, more effectively than the cytoplasm in a control cell. So you get less slowdown. But in the KRAS mutant, 
you actually see a way more decrease in diffusion than in the, the P53 control cell. So there's a bigger perturbation there. And we kind of guess that there might be less mechanical stability in a KRAS movement cell. So we also looked in cells that were expressing a GFP that's targeted to the nucleus as a way of checking whether there is nuclear rupture that's happening just during growth. And so what you see if we focus on this cell right here, every time the GFP blinks out and leaves the nucleus, that's because the nuclear membrane ruptures. So these cells are growing, these are KRAS cells growing under compression. And you see that there's this frequent nuclear rupture happening. And here's another example down here. Um, and you see that there's rupture of the cell and you can even see micronuclei being ejected out. And so we think that both in interphase and in mitosis, and this might lead to all kinds of DNA damage that, that might be resolved uh, or lead to problems in, in anaphase. Um, again, we're trying to figure all this out. But one thing that's very interesting about all of this is that we know that in, um, in recent sequencing studies, this idea of this slow linear accumulation of mutations in, in tumors has kind of been, uh, it, it's, it's fallen out of favor in, in, many, in many examples. And in fact, what you tend to see um, is a pattern of mutation that's more consistent with giant catastrophes happening, where multiple genes all get chopped up at the same time through things like chromothripsis and massive aneuploidies and then subsequent selection upon that new genome. And so this is from the Gallinger lab. Um, this is what they kind of found to be happening all the time in pancreatic cancer as well. And so what's not known is what, the, what is the driving force for these huge um, genomic catastrophes. And we suggest that perhaps what we're seeing with this combination of the KRAS mutation, which again is always present, and compressive stress, which again is always present, might be part of this story. So we've been doing evolution experiments uh, and we're doing genome sequencing and we're, and we're seeing interesting things uh, in terms of you know, chromosome amplifications and losses and so forth. So on pause for now as everything is, but um, excited to see how that all plays out. Okay, so that, that's kind of what I wanted to tell you for the most part. Um, keeping crowding at a perfect homeostatic level is crucial for life. Um, I've alluded to this number, a number of times, but we're very interested in looking at neurons as well. So, you know, here's an um, image of a neuron from Ramon y Cajal, and then here's an actin mRNA that's trying to make its way up and down an axon. And this is a tremendously crowded environment. It's a huge problem to move these RNPs up and down um, these meter long axons. And as I was talking to Mark about earlier, you know, the, these connections between these RNA granules, which themselves are condensates and things that they track with like lysosomes, that they're all, you know, speaking to things like tor kinase. They're all gonna be dependent on things like the concentration of ribosomes, concentration of microtubules. And they're also gonna be impacted, I'm sure, by changes in the mechanical environment that may impact you know, the amount of space available. There was a very nice paper from Kevin Chalou um, earlier last year, or the end of last year, showing that the, the mechanical properties of brain change very substantially as a function of age. And so we're interested in working with Kevin and other people, uh, Hamali Fatnani here in New York, and starting to build models. So we have nanoparticles in, in um, we, we can put them in neurons. Um, um, we want to start looking at these transport processes and so forth, and phase separation processes, the kind of things that I know that you guys are interested in as well. Um, but this is challenging work, uh, and we need to talk to to more people about it. So final slide, all the drugs that make you live forever, and you know, metformin stops you from aging, so does red wine with its resveratrol, 
rapamycin and starving yourself and making life horrible by putting apples in your cheeks. Um, all of these things impact things like tour, crowding, um, mechanical changes, like inflammation, all of these things we think are playing a role in feeding into things like aberrant phase separation. Um, so we're, we're curious to keep on following down these leads. And I'll finish up just by, again, acknowledging Greg, Tamash, and Morgan, along with all of these other collaborators that we've been working with over the years, and stop again for any further questions. Thank you, wonderful stuff. It's wonderful how you weave together so many different themes in your research. <laughs> yeah, um, we probably have too many themes in our research. Nah. Always looking for collaborations. Absolutely. And it also makes me wonder about um, 2D cell culture, mm -hmm. why, why it works at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 2D cell culture, you know, it uh, certainly has its limitations. For the imaging we're doing, um, unfortunately, we've been also using 2D cell culture because we need to have very high resolution imaging. Sure. Um, but I think that we need to also move into things like organoid models and things like that. Yeah, just the whole idea, I mean, your, all of your work shows how important these crowding effects are and the three-dimensionality of the real system. And yet we, we, we are able sometimes to get quite useful data even from relatively simple 2D models, which it's great that we can, but it's, it's a good thing. It's a it's good fortune that we can, given how much simpler those systems are than the, the, real, the, the real cellular environment. Yeah. I think Alicia has a question. Okay. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could expand on what you think is driving crowding in the nucleus. Do you think it's like really large molecules? Do you think it's like really abundant molecules? Do you think it's like RNA? What do you think it is? Yeah, it's a good question. So everything depends on length scale as well. So we've been really focused on this 20 to 50 nanometer length scale because that's the size of our nanoparticles. At that length scale, um, my guess is that chromatin and um, ribonuclear particles that, you know, forming RNAs and so forth are probably dominant. I think there's a lot of volume taken up by RNA. Um, if you actually calculate the amount of volume that chromatin is supposedly taking up in the nucleus, it's not a tremendous fraction. You might imagine that it would be like half of it, but it's not. It's like I don't remember the number, but on the order of like 10%. Um, nevertheless, I'm sure it's important. Um, now, if you get down to small things like individual proteins, I think it's interesting that things like pioneer transcription factors are, are very small, typically. They don't feel that kind of crowding very much at all. They can zip through these very, very crowded, large complexes and make their way into little tight spaces. Not to say that they're not interacting with structures or um, colliding with, with smaller things on the length scale of proteins. Um, but the, you know, it's like the difference between trying to get through traffic on a bicycle versus in a truck. Right? So I think that's how biology manages to deal with these perturbations that grind everything to a halt. At the 100 nanometer length scale, they still have pathways that can keep things going and adjust the system that are operating at the five nanometers on the scale. I, I have a question. Hi, Hi. Um, So uh, you, you showed the cross mutation had a big impact changing this um, uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you look at the sequence of that, where the mutation is, does it make sense? Like, is there a certain structure that's involved um, that may drive driving the uh, difference the impression? Well, the KRAS molecule is just it's a small GTPase that um, is used to transmit information from growth factor signaling pathways and so forth, and make decisions about whether to grow and divide. It basically is an actuator of many signaling pathways. 
the mutation, so usually the way that it works is that when it's in the GDP bound, GDP bound form, it's off and it's not telling the cell to divide, for example. And when it gets positive signals, it converts to the GTP bound form and then tells the cell to do things like divide. And then it's the GTPA, so it will spontaneously convert back to the GDP form. The mutation that you find in cancer breaks the GTPA's functionality. So this G12D mutation means that the thing gets loaded with GTP, but then it, its GTPase doesn't work anymore. And so it stays on all the time. And that means that it's always telling the cell to divide and a bunch of other things, like it impacts the cytoskeleton. I kind of alluded to that a little bit. Um, so it's not that the structure of that particular mutation is doing anything to crowding. It's more that all of the pathways downstream, so the rate of bio biogenesis, the rate of cell division, the activity of the cytoskeleton, all of these things are what are ultimately defining the physical properties of the cell. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. I have another question. So you say to show that uh, the difference oh, when this nanoparticle gets out of the, cyto the nucleus to the cytoplasm and during only happens during mitosis, that, that, that model is so unique. And it's it's very interesting. So have you looked at so in addition to the chromatin change you observed, is there any other stuff that's going on? I mean, define it because it looks like a very self is restricted event that happening only pushing this out. Uh, I, I'm sure the the physical pressure is one of the reason, but I. I just feel like th there must be something else that happening, contributing to it. Um, Sorry, Molly, you're gonna have to repeat that question because I got kicked off Zoom right as you started oh, asking. Right. It. So just go back <laughs> to the beginning and just ask again. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so when, <laughs> sorry, I didn't notice you froze. That's okay. <laughs> um, um, so when you observe the, um, the nanobody that coming out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm and it only happens during mitosis, Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very interesting model that you can show a lot of differences, just not, on, just not limited to the chromatin change where it's driven additional pressure to pushing them out. Have you looked at other things that might be happening together with this chromatin change? Because I can't imagine that the physical force to push them out is the only reason. Because it, it, it might be. <laughs> but but there might be other changes. Um, another thing that I that comes to me is because uh, you have tested all these pork inhibitors and all that. Have you have you just tried to put them in a, together with that model? Because I know rapamycin also regulate proliferation and mitosis. If you put compound in that model, does that change? Because you already showed that thing changes the the nanoparticle uh, the nano yeah, in uh, the first option, uh, first uh, part of the, the presentation. Yeah, I, I guess to that. paraphrase what you were asking, can I relate the first part of the talk to how particles are being excluded from the nucleus? Like, do these yeah. Yeah, 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 somehow talk to one another? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think we'd have to do the experiment a little bit differently because if we just hit the cells with rapamycin, they won't divide. But what we could do, I could imagine is arrest cells in mitosis and then maybe osmotically perturb them to change crowding. And you might predict that that would have interesting impacts on chromatin structure that would then change the you know, physical nature of the decondensing and um, you know, the clustering of the chromosomes. So yeah, that would be interesting to, to, to think about. Aside from the physical you know, nature of how dense the right. chromatin is and how it um, might physically through you know, the, the, the size of the mesh being too large or too small for the nanoparticles to get in, we're also curious about whether things like the chemical nature of, of the chromatin versus the nanoparticle could be important. So we know that our nanoparticles have a negative surface charge 
what if they had a positive surface charge? Would they then go into the nucleus? You know, the things that get you into the nucleus are things like very basic sequences, nuclear localization sequences. Um, I don't know. That would be really interesting to try. Um, so yeah, but we actually set up to do some of those experiments, but we haven't got there yet. But that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Great. Thank you. Maybe one last question, Gianna, maybe? One last question. Well, um, you actually kind of touched on, on my question. It was basically how, how to balance between the mesh size and the, the, mm -hmm. uh, com how compatible the surface of the nanoparticles is. Um, I was wondering if, say, you functionalize them with like a small, you know, yeah. HP1 alpha, for instance, if you were able to partition them into the heterochromatin in addition yeah. to the heterochromatin or... That's a really interesting question. Yeah, even not thinking about the nuclear exclusion during mitosis, mm -hmm. but if you look at the interphase cell and where the yeah. particles go and do they go into heterochromatin or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could certainly do that. And, and we definitely want to do that as well. Um, I think that would be super cool. We know that the behavior of molecules in general depends tremendously on their surface charge. Um, but Poolman had really interesting work showing that negatively charged molecules typically diffuse way more rapidly, like orders of magnitude, two orders of magnitude, more, more rapidly than positively charged molecules. That's in the cytoplasm. And the nucleoplasm, yeah, I don't think we really know, know that much. So, and then if we could look through this whole physical diagram of size versus charge versus hydrophobicity and see how things start to segregate, mm -hmm. I think that that's really interesting. You know, yeah. And then, you know, disorder and how all of that plays a role. Um, and how that disorder is modulated in terms of its chemical properties as you and post translational modifications, you can imagine that you would have dramatic effects on how things partition. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, thank Looking you. Looking forward to see what, what comes out. Well, great. I think we'll I think we'll wrap up. Liam, wonderful presentation. Great to hear about you, your work, and um, I bet there will be a lot of other follow up questions. What always happens is we go off and we talk about lectures and come back later with more. So if that's okay with you, we'll we'll come back with some additional thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah. If you either want to email me, or if you want to get me back on Zoom, if you have questions in person, either way. Sure. I'd love to talk more. So Very thank good. you so much for inviting me, Mark. It's been really fun. And thank you all for your attention and your really great, your great questions. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Thank right. you so much. See you later. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.